Well, like I mentioned, I am not Jerome. Many of you don't mistake me for Jerome, but I'm so honored and blessed to be able to share a little bit this morning. Um, our pastor, he's been on some heaters for some sermons lately. It's been like good preaching. Uh, it's been so fun to watch this season of life in this church and to be able to, um, you know, be t- working together to build something in our city for the people of our city, in our community. Uh, and that has been such an honor to participate in, to be a part of. It's been really, really cool. Although I will admit, Aaron touched on something this morning. I, I am really, really tired. I've had a long, long two weeks. Um, and I actually want to show you where I spent last week. Uh, the most magical place on earth. That's the slogan, at least. Um, Completely exhausted, dragging a two-year-old. This is my daughter, Lottie, and that's my son, Solomon. That's my wife, Abigail, and these are two of our best friends and their daughter. Um, we dragging around a toddler and a two-year-old through Disney, through every park imaginable, through every, every crevice and ride and everything you could possibly do. Uh, we were very, very fortunate and blessed to be able to go experience Disney. It was our first time, and it was so overwhelming. Uh, it, the next picture actually shows, for those of you who are close enough, you can see the kids are having the best time of their life in the most <laughs> magical place on earth. And we all felt that way by the end of the trip because we missed our flight and we traveled for 14 hours on our last day and we got back to Indianapolis about 10.30 p.m. after supposed to, we were supposed to be back at 10.30 a.m. Um, so we were really tired, but we have, have one more picture. This was actually one of the highlights of them blowing their bubbles and the magic of Disney and the castle and all of that stuff. They had such a good time. But that is not to say that we got rest at all or that we came back like, oh, we're so ready to go. We were like, we need a break. We need a break. But, you know, that's how life goes. Um, we're so fortunate to be able to do fun stuff like that. And when Jerome asked me to preach, I knew it was going to be a little hairy coming into this. So we'll see where we go together. I thought, <laughs> can I just wing it this morning? No. No, no, no. I'm not winging it. I promise I'm not winging it. Uh, I'm just really tired. Before we left, though, Jerome told me, I really, really, really want you to not think about this place while you're gone, which he, he told me he wants me to try to do it because he knows it's actually impossible for me to fully do it, but, you know, try to take some rest time. Um, he told me, try not to, but I know you're going to because when we're away, it gives us this time and the space that we just don't have when we're here, where we're busy and we're doing things. It gives us space to think about stuff. And when we were at Disney and when I was traveling, it did give me a lot of space to think about our church and it was actually thinking back through the last, um, last season of church. Pastor John shared on his last Sunday on staff, I'm sure it won't be your last sermon, <laughs> I'm sure it won't be, uh, on his, his last sermon on staff, it was a, a, a message about togetherness, that God has given us this vision this year of praying together, being together, and serving together. And it was truly a call to be together. That is such a celebration that we're even able to be together. Three years ago, I don't know if any of you remember what happened three years ago, but we were not able to have church services together, and that was such a difficult season of life. So when we're able to gather as a body together, it is a season where we should be excited and celebrating. Uh, he shared this scripture, and I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but this is like, this is so good. In F- 1 Corinthians 12, starting at 12 through 27, This is the call that God has given us as the body. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not the hand. That does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have been given many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. 
How strange a body would be if it was only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. And the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some of the parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually those that are most necessary. And the parts that we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that the extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members. This is the thing that struck me within that sermon is this is what makes for the harmony among the members so that all members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. I read that as an encouragement and a reminder of part of our mission here as a church, to be together and what that entails. Some of us are gonna be the foot and some of us are gonna be the hand and some of us are gonna be the head and the eyes and the ears. But we are part of one body and we should be glad in it. As one part is celebrated, the other parts are glad. I was dwelling on that as we were away and I was really I've had a very interesting season in my spiritual life as I've been navigating and uh, navigating becoming a father and raising a young boy who's now four years old and becoming more of a man every single day. I've been dealing with this whole thing. How do I fit into the system? Or how do I fit into the body? How does my son fit into the body? How do I lead him into knowing that he's a part of the body? And I've taken this challenge upon myself and sought leadership and guidance and eldership in navigating that because I think it's pretty easy for us to look out into the world and see a lot of young men and women who are not being led into anything. They're being led into existentialism and crisis of faith and not knowing what's up or what's down. And it's very easy for us within our own community to see ourselves spinning if we don't plant ourselves on the rock, if we don't plant ourselves on something that is true and known and solid. This season of our church is one about discipleship. Uh, our women's discipleship walk was just a few weeks ago and our men are on the discipleship walk now and we talk about discipleship so much and I think about discipleship a lot in relationship to my son in relationship to my daughter, in relationship to my wife, in relationship to my pastor? How am I being discipled and who am I discipling? So as I've been wrestling with this question, I stumbled across a really great devotional called The Primal Path. And that's, some of you might, what's that have to do with anything? Uh, and it is returning to the ancient biblical tradition of raising men into men. And it has so incredibly blessed my life to, one, have uh, pastors and elders who are creating materials that I can read and then I can take that and I can apply it to my relationship with my son or with my wife or with my daughter or with my family or with those who lead me and those who are led by me. And there's been this concept that I've been studying and it's, it's very closely related to discipleship within the body and being together and how we process being together. And he, the, the pastor, John Tyson from Church of the City, if you've heard me speak before, you've probably heard me quote him or talk about him. Uh, he has this phrase about initiation. And I love that word initiation because it's so closely um, related to discipleship, but it gives us a different spin on the idea while maintaining the core of what discipleship is. And initiation really starts with one initiating another into a culture, into belief, into understanding, into a philosophy. If you think about initiation, you might think of a frat or a fraternity, or um, you might be thinking of a group of guys, a cohort, that they initiate you into the thing. And really, when you are initiated, you are brought into and led to a system of culture and beliefs about something. And when they deem that you have 
figured it out, you become an initiator. You start leading people into the fold. And so I think that is so closely related to this idea of discipleship because each and every one of us is being discipled and discipling in our lives. There are people that we are being led by and there are people that we will lead. And I think in our church, not Radiant specifically, in the big church, we may have fallen asleep to that fact sometimes. We may have forgotten that we are being discipled and we are discipling. That's something that I found in this text about the body being together so necessary. Because some of us will see and some of us will hear, but without telling the rest of the body about it, you know, we're all experiencing, let me get a little existential for a second, we're all experiencing reality and all of our senses are firing when we're feeling, wow, that light is really bright or I can smell coffee. Praise the Lord, we can smell coffee. We're able to process what's going on around us, and we send messages through our brain to our other senses. That is what the body is doing too, and through that process, we are warning and telling and teaching. We're sharing. We're mourning. We're happy. We're feeling things as a body. But when we cut off that discipleship tool that we use as a church, when we lose sight of that, Who's to say the left hand knows what the right hand does? How do we know what the eyes see or what the body feels? How many of you have heard that scripture from Proverbs 22? Train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they grow old, they shall not depart from it. It's an excellent, excellent scripture. But why do we stop with our children? I've heard that quoted so many times in my life, but why would we ever stop with our children from the youngest to the eldest, why would we ever want to stop being discipled? Why would we ever want to stop having support and training and growing into our next season? The world lacks discipleship and formation. It lacks elders to initiate youth into a path that they should walk. Not from a lack of effort, but I think it's actually from a lack of relationship. It is easy to tell our youth what to do, but without the context of relationship, they have no idea why they should trust you. And that gets really dangerous when we start applying that to our faith and we tell them that you should trust in Jesus. If they have no idea why they should trust in Jesus or that they could even trust you, they can start to spiral really fast, especially in a world where information is flying at them so quickly The world is flipping around and they watch it through algorithms and social media feeds and through YouTube. They see the world spinning so fast and they don't know what to look towards. My heart, since I started working in ministry, which was about 10 years ago now, that's, wow. I got a lot of gray hair, I'll tell you that much. My heart has always been... um, Looking at my peers, you know, I'm 32, uh, looking at my peers who have shelved their faith for a later date or said, I'm going to put that on the back burner for now and I'm going to go do what I want or I'm going to figure out a belief system that fits what I feel right now more. My heart breaks for my peers and I've been on that side of it too. I've been... There are times where it feels like it would be easier to not believe than to believe. But on the flip side of that, knowing the pain that comes with that, witnessing the pain that comes with walking away from Christ, losing stability and hope that there's something more for each and every one of us and there's something more and beyond this existence right now, what we see. My heart has been breaking for those people. Um... So this morning, I want to talk about what does our church look like when we create a culture in which discipleship is a priority? It's not an afterthought. And listen, I love the discipleship walk. I think it's a great experience. I'll be the first to tell you, it's wonderful. 
But three days is not a replacement for something that has to be ongoing every moment of our life. Three days could never be the thing that leads us into the next season of our life as we mature and we grow older, as we are discipled and discipling. If we leave it to three days, then we're missing out on a lot of other days. We're missing out on a lot of other opportunity to see growth. So this morning, I want to read a part of my devotional from the Primal Path. Um, It talks about the four great deficits of the world, these deficits in which we become believing of these facts. We become believing of these deficits, and then because of that, we're missing a big part of the picture there. And I really believe that these four deficits are a part of the plan of Satan, the great enemy. Because, you know, his, his greatest tool is not that he's going to, you know, do something crazy to you, but that he can deceive you. His tool is that he's a really smooth talker and that he can get us to believe and fall on our face and believe that we have it all figured out. So these four great deficits, and then we'll have four answers to those deficits later on. Um, But starting with this first deficit is the acceptance deficit in our lives. It's the thing that we would begin to believe that we will never be enough. So much of what we do today is trying to prove our worth to the world. How many of you are trying to prove your worth to the world? That's all of us, 100%. Sometimes it's proving our fathers wrong. Sometimes it's proving our partners wrong. Sometimes it's proving our teachers or our coaches wrong. But late at night, so many of us know in our bones that in spite of of all that we've done, we still fall short. Paul said that we have all fall, we are all all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have a glory deficit driving all of us. We are not what we're destined to be, and sin traps us into trying to get glory from the wrong source. Trying to gain glory from the wrong source is the the thing that leads us to that deficit. The next deficit is a a freedom deficit. It would say that we are slaves to our desires. So many things entrap us in this modern world. We feel enslaved to our food and our diets. People feel enslaved to pornography. Young people feel enslaved to video games and YouTube. I think all of us feel enslaved to other people's opinions about us. People feel enslaved to debt and to their work. No matter how hard we try or how well we do in short bursts of time, we seem to live under the power of both trivial and tyrannical forces. And because of that, we reduce life to a series of struggles. That's tough. The belonging deficit is that each of us are on our own. How many of you agree that loneliness has become an epidemic in our world today? Coming out of 2020 and COVID and lockdown, you hear story after story after story of person who was so depressed and so lonely and so heartbroken So many people took their own lives. So many people pulled away from family. So many people pulled away from the thing that was their foundation. So many people left the church. In my thing, it's directed specifically at men, but I think this applies to everyone. Some men feel unseen and unknown. And I would say many people feel unseen and unknown. According to the CDC, social isolation and loneliness have been linked to increased risk for heart disease and stroke, type 2 diabetes, depression, anxiety, addiction, suicide, self-harm, dementia, and earlier death. People feel lonely amongst other people now. We are so stuck in this deficit of believing that we're on our own, that we can be amongst a group of other people and feel alone. The final deficit is that we struggle with an authority deficit. 
we begin to believe that we're powerless to move forward. We all have a sense that we're living in a world that's controlled by other people. We feel discipled by an algorithm and tech billionaires that seem to have more of a direct impact on our life than our faith and our communities actually do. Some people even believe that it has more impact than God himself. These algorithms shape our attention, our affection, our emotions, and it's hard to break free. But even the choices that we do make, we begin to believe, and sometimes rightfully so, are architected by others to give us an illusion of self-control. But they all lead us to the desired ends of the choice designer. So that's pretty heavy. That's pretty hard. But here's the good news, is those deficits are the end. It's not the whole picture of the story for those of us who are believers, those of us who are in the discipling process and are growing out of those deficits. So we're going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and read. And I think I think I don't know quite know why I put this in here at first. Um, this is Paul talking about the thorn in his flesh. But now I do realize that we all have these thorns, we all have these things, we all have these shortcomings that we begin to believe about ourselves. But those things aren't the end of the story when we begin to believe that the grace of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross is enough to fill the gap. So this is Paul writing about um, a revelation that he had, but also himself and the experience that he was having here on earth. That experience is worth boasting about. That's the revelation. But I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weakness. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged for the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in my insults and hardships, in my persecutions, in my troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. These deficits, they're a reality that we face as humans living and experiencing this time, this period of life, this world, they are a reality for so many of us outside of the context of Christ's redemption. But I want to share a little bit of the truth about those deficits and how Christ fills them in. Theologian Richard Lovelace wrote about the importance of the gospel getting into the depths of each of our hearts not just rattling around in our mind, but experiencing it in our heart, and therefore leading to a reorientation of our life towards Christ. He says, at the outset of each day, we should hear God saying, you are accepted. You are accepted because the guilt of sin is covered by the righteousness of Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, See how much, see how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like Him for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. Praise God for that gift. 
The next deficit was being enslaved. But the truth is that you are free from the bondage to sin through the power of Jesus in your life. Romans 6, uh, verses 17 through 18, says, Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Thank God that we are freed. You are not alone, the loneliness deficit. You are actually truly not alone because, as a believer, you are accompanied by the counselor, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. Praise God for the Holy Spirit in our lives. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 10. This is Jesus telling his disciples before the arrest and before his persecution and before his execution and crucifixion, before all of that, he's explaining to this, and I imagine they just sat there and were like, we have no idea what's going on, man. You're a great rabbi. What are you saying? But it says, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, the, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness will be available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. That righteousness comes through the Holy Spirit. It comes through the Holy Spirit dwelling with us, being with us, making us whole. And many of us know, even with the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're not completely made whole because we're still on this side of eternity. But we can rest knowing that the Holy Spirit is with us. That we are not alone. That we have wisdom beyond our own human understanding. That we have ability beyond our own understanding. Jesus tells uh, tells his disciples that there's more. He says in later there, or earlier in John, he tells them, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. How many of you want to do even greater works? How many of you want to go even further than you've gone before? How many of you want to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life even deeper? How many of you want to see a mighty act of the Holy Spirit take over our communities, fill our children's lives, bring healing to broken families? I want to see that. And Jesus is telling, you will go beyond your own understanding. You will go to even further places. And truly, the church did as it grew out of that moment when the, 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 the apostles and the early believers received the Holy Spirit. It exploded throughout the known world, the message of the gospel. That last deficit about feeling powerless, the truth is that you are in command. You have the freedom to resist and expel the power of darkness. Ephesians 6, 11 through 13 says, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authority, authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Our culture right now is dealing with and defining itself with a massive deficit. People are hopeless, they're hurting, they're broken, they don't want to keep going on. But I think part of the key 
to seeing healing within ourselves and within our communities is a formation that we pursue to become more like Jesus. When we are accepted and we live in acceptance, we stop compensating and overcompensating for approval for what we do. When we rest knowing that we are free through Christ, we reject the forces of sin that would hold us back. We seek to break out of addiction and hurt and cycles of trauma. When we rest knowing that the Spirit is with us, we can experience His power, His presence, and His peace, knowing that whatever goes before us, we have the power to deal with. And when we agree and know that we have authority through the Holy Spirit, we can stop submitting to slavery and we can start commanding ourselves. We can start leading ourselves out of sin via the Holy Spirit. The last part of that devotional um, that I received was a really good reminder to me. Um, It says, becoming beloved isn't a one-time announcement. It's a continual conversation. And when you give God a chance to speak, acceptance, freedom, belonging, and authority come out of it. My encouragement today for our church is that we speak these things over one another as a beginning step towards discipleship with one another. The young and the old the young in faith and the elder in faith speak these truths over one another. Tell one another you are free by the power of Christ. Remind each other that you are not alone because the Holy Spirit goes with you. Remind each other that you are God's beloved children that he has chosen you in a moment such as this to speak life and truth into a wicked world. In John chapter six, Christ says something really powerful to his disciples that I'm also sure they kind of glazed right over, not knowing quite how to take it yet. But it says, this is the only work that God wants from you. Believe in the one he sent. I'm confident I can do better at this every single day. I know as a church, as believers, this can be a challenge to believe in the one he sent and the things that he spoke to us because it's a challenge living in this world. It's a challenge um, being present and conscious of the one he sent and what he taught us. But that's my encouragement to us as a church in this moment as we're building a community together, as we're growing as a faith family, as we're expanding our ministries and the things that we do in our community, even as we're growing as Christians through the process of discipleship, through the process of the Holy Spirit providing beyond what we could ever imagine. Keep believing in the one he sent. Go back to the treasure of the gospel message and dig in deep to the truth of it. In each of these scriptures I had pulled out, there's so much more depth to glean from it. There's so much more richness to pull from the words of Christ. There is so much truth to pull from the good news. So as you're walking through your life, believe in the one he sent and what he told you. In Colossians, the letter to the church at Colossae, uh, the introduction and the welcome to that church. I love, love, love. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture um, because it's so uh, evocative of imagery and so beautiful and poetic but direct at the same time. Uh, It's in chapter one, verses 15 through 20. It says, Christ is the visible image of an invisible God. He existed before anything was created and supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. 
He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning and supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through God, reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. As the band comes forward, I just want to challenge us this morning to be looking for opportunities in which we can both recognize that Christ is supreme in leading each of our lives, but also be seeking opportunities, reaching across the aisle, maybe a literal aisle, to someone that you know needs someone. Looking out amongst our community of believers, those who you work with, those you share a, a faith relationship with, looking at those people and saying, how could God use me? How could the Holy Spirit give me the gifting to help them? I think it ultimately boils down to how can I point to Christ with my life? How can I point to the goodness of God, His provision, His stability, His strength, And I would also challenge us to call out the deficits in our own life and in the lives of other believers as we see them. As we see people who are struggling and hurting, falling into the trap of believing that they're alone, bring a light into that place. Bring hope to them. Preach the good news back to them. If they're a believer, preach the good news back to them. Because there is at no point where we will exhaust the good news. There is no point in which the gospel has worn out its welcome in our lives. Come on, church. That's like, that's true. Proclaim the good news in everywhere we go, in everything we do. All we have to do is point to Christ, and he takes care of the rest. As we close this morning... Will you stand with me? We're going to pray. But we're going to believe that there's still something more for each and every one of us. There's still something more for our relationship with God. There's still things that we can grow into. I'm the first to admit, there's a lot of stuff I need to grow into. But rest knowing that we don't have to have it all figured out right now. And it's okay to, to go to someone and say, can we have coffee? I need some help. Can we meet up and study the Bible together? I actually, I, I just started another Bible study with a group of guys here from the church. And it's always kind of weird going to a Bible study as a pastor because you feel a lot of pressure to like say something really profound or something deep or like understand the thing better than anyone else in the room. And it's so awesome because I'm definitely the dumbest person in the room at it. It's awesome. It's so, it's, but it's such a blessing because it reminds me that I'm not alone and there's so much further to go in my faith, in my life. And that's for each and every one of us. There's always more depth that we can reach. There is more fulfillment in the Holy Spirit that we can find. We will do exceedingly and abundantly more through the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together as a church. Father God, we thank you for your word and how it speaks into our lives. how you can remind us that there's always more. And that's a good thing. Not one of us will ever top off our faith meter. 
Not one of us will ever reach the point where we have reached full maturity. There will be opportunity for us to pour into others and to always be poured into. And God, I ask that you just give us a spirit to see and hear those in our church right now that we would be able to offer something towards. That we would be able to pour into one another and remind each other to not believe in the deficits that the culture of our world would point towards or that our loneliness and depression and anxiety would point us towards, but that there is full life for those who believe in Christ. Let us see your people the way that you see them. And Father, I ask for those who are here this morning who are on the fence about belief or don't believe at all. Give us eyes and ears to see them, to hear from them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak into their lives and remind them that they're not alone, that they are not powerless, that they have agency in their life. And all they have to do is come to you, the source of life. I ask that your Holy Spirit sends us from this place full of heart with the ability to see the world around us and not be afraid of it, but be overjoyed at the opportunity to speak life into it. We love you, God. We celebrate your deep love for us this morning. Thank you for what you're doing in this community and all that you will do. We come it with great expectation, knowing that you are so good. We love you and we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you stand and worship with us?